Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. God is good. And all the time, Make sure I am turned on. Am I am turned on now? All right. How are you? How was your day? So was mine, very quiet, and I like quiet days. They allow me to concentrate, to reflect, to think, and to meditate on what I have to say on the evenings that stand before me. Who is with us tonight? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. You're with us for the first time. May I see your hand? First time. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist, all right? You're with us for the second time. God bless you. God bless you. The third time. God, <laughs> God doubly bless you, my lovely sister. God bless you. God bless you. We're delighted with your presence. For those who may be online, thank you very much for joining us. And for those who will listen to the recorded version, may the Lord bless you as verily as he will bless us tonight. I am very much aware this is Sunday night. It means work tomorrow. And so I will exercise temperance in all things, including preaching. I will release you by 7 o'clock. Are you with me? Quite possibly before. It does not take God long to bless his people or for the truth to convict an honest heart. So I say again, God is good. <laughs> and all the time. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Sacrifice anything in your life except truth. Give up your house for truth. Give up your car for truth. Give up whatever for truth. Never sacrifice truth. For anything else. Because when you sacrifice truth, you sacrifice the Savior. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. And as I told you yesterday sometime, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is truth. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, the Father is truth. Therefore, you and I must be children of truth. Before I get into the message, which is, Lord, save me. I always remind you, do three little favors for me. Favor number one, make sure these things don't ring if you're not using them as a Bible. Even if you are using them, make sure the sound is down. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put what? Your words, where? In that man's mouth. It's a very, very serious request. Jeremiah chapter one, verse nine. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And as surely as God lives, I want to speak God's words. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. I told you yesterday, God is a reasonable God and a reasoning God. And for those of us made in his image, we ought to feel the burden to be reasonable and reasoning people like our Savior. Can you say amen? amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this privilege we have to come into your house to worship you. We thank you to God for freedom of worship we still enjoy in this country. As we bow before you, Father, if we've sinned against you, forgive us, I pray. Grant us your grace. Grant us your spirit, for he is the spirit of truth. Without his ministry, dear God, nothing I say will make sense. 
I ask you to open our eyes and our minds, our hearts, that we may hear, that we may heed, and that we may obey. Bless all our guests, online and in person. Give me simple language today, God. Fill my heart with the humility of Jesus Christ and remind me at all times I'm in this sacred desk for your glory and your glory alone. Bless Pastor Ovid. Thank you for his ministry and his leadership. Give him the wisdom of Solomon, a God, that he may guide your people forward and upward. Hear this humble prayer, Father. Save us when you come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let us go to Matthew 14. We'll read from verse 25. Matthew 14. The Spirit just told me don't go there. Let's not go there. Let us go to Genesis 3. We may get back to Matthew 14. What's our subject? Lord, save me. Mm -hmm. It's 615. Genesis 3, we we'll read from verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, He shall not eat of it, neither shall he touch it, lest he die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now God had told Adam in Genesis 2, 16, 17, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The devil said, Ye shall not surely die. So we had two competing words, and Adam and Eve had to choose whose word will I heed, God's words or the words of a stranger. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked sinners, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Stop. Adam, as a sinner, when he heard the sound of God walking in the garden, he ran from God. Notice how I began my words. Adam, as a sinner ran from God. And Eve, in the same condition as her husband, ran from God. They hid themselves and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. No one is lost by accident. We're lost by the choices we make. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now I should tell you that this Lord God who came down was Jesus Christ, their maker, their creator. He came and they ran. Now, when you run from the creator, when you run from Christ, who is the mighty God, from what are you running? What did Jesus tell Martha at the grave of Lazarus? I am the resurrection and the life. To run from Christ is to run from life. And so Jesus told the Pharisees in John chapter 5 verse 40, You will not come to me that you might have life. To come to Christ is to come to life. Not just physical, physiological life. I mean spiritual life, the level of eternal life. To come to Christ is to come to life. Adam and Eve ran from Christ. Now, why did they run from Christ? Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans 3. Our subject, 
Lord, save me. That's what Peter said when he began to drown or began to sink. Do you have Romans chapter 3? Let's read from verse 10 and we'll read microscopically. What do I mean by that? Very, very carefully, very closely looking at every word in the text. Are you at Romans 3 verse 10? If you have my version, read with me. What does that say? But as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. Now read carefully. There's none that seeketh after God. Stop. In the condition as a sinner, that man, that woman does not seek God. It is contrary to the person's genetic makeup to seek God. What do I mean by genetic makeup? Why are your eyes blue? Did you paint them? Why are your eyes blue or your eyes brown or black? When was that decided? Well, <laughs> when your mother and father came together, they shared what? Oh, yeah, well, that's a fact. Oh, yeah, sure. Because of that, the determination was made, your eyes would be brown or blue or gray. No, well, what are those things people put in their eyes? Uh, no contact lens can change the color of your eyes. Are you with me? Why is your hair blonde or black or redhead or brunette? Because that's the genetic determination. That's why the Bible says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? The leopard's spots are written on the genes. Are you with me? The Ethiopian is black because that's written on the genes and he can soak in Clorox for three weeks. He's still black. Are you with me? Now, to the same degree, a sinner avoids God. It's genetic. That's what the Bible says. But as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. No sinner is naturally righteous. Now, if a man is not naturally righteous, what is he naturally? Unrighteous or sinful. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Okay. So we go back to the garden. Here comes God. Here comes life. Here comes peace. Here comes blessings. Here comes righteousness. Here comes power. Here comes everything. Adam and Eve run. They ran because that's all they could do. Let me put it more bluntly. A sinner cannot come to God on his own power. What's our subject? A sinner cannot what? Save himself or herself. Let me say it again. You and I, without Christ, cannot save ourselves. Now, we can lead decent lives. And you're all decent. But as I often say, I believe most atheists are decent. Are you with me? But they actively deny God. Most atheists, I believe, are decent. Law abiding, return their taxes, obey the speed limit, respect their neighbors, take a shower every day. They're nice people. They do not believe in God. No sinner can save himself or herself. Let the Bible embarrass us with some. <laughs> Let's go to Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6, 25 after 6. Our subject, Lord, save me. Isaiah 64, did I say 64? Verse 6. Are you there? 
Let's read the first two lines of Isaiah 64, 6. You are very familiar with it. What does that say? But we are all as what? An unclean thing. And all our righteousness, finish that passage, are as filthy rags. Stop. Now, I want you to observe what is a filthy rag in the eyes of God. The righteousness of a sinner is in God's eyes as filthy rags. The verse doesn't say all your sins are like filthy rags. That's too obvious. All the good deeds you do, good in the eyes of humanity, in my eyes, says God, filthy rags. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which in heaven. Many shall say to me at that day, Lord, Lord, have we not? Come on. Prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done what? Many wonderful works. That's what they said. They present to God a resume of good works. Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you, ye that work iniquity. The judge of all the earth calls that resume iniquity. What were the items? Prophesied in your name. Cast out devils in your name. Done many wonderful works. And Jesus calls it iniquity. Because all our righteousness, filthy rags in the eyes of Jesus Christ, in the eyes of God, the eyes of the Spirit. No human being can present to God an argument why he or she should be saved. You can hold all the offices in your church. And don't give them up, please. That does not qualify you for a place in God's kingdom. We have to understand. Well, let the Bible tell you. Because whenever something is embarrassing, I like to have someone else say it. Go to Romans 7. Romans 7. Let's read verse 18. Our subject, Lord, save me. Are you there? Amen. Let me pray again. Dear God, continue to be with me. I pray, restrain my carnal flesh. Let your glory be my aim and my desire. In your Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. For I know this, that in me, that is, in my flesh, Romans 7, 18, dwelleth what? No good thing. In my flesh, is Paul, dwells no good thing. Not one good thing, no good thing. Now, the spirit that inspired Paul inspired Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Go to John chapter 6. John 6. John 6. Our subject, Lord, save me. And I'm trying to get you to understand, no human being can do anything to save himself or herself. Or can present a work that tells God on the basis of my work, save me. Absolutely impossible. John 6, verse 63, listen to Jesus Christ. It is the spirit that quickeneth. What's the next statement? The flesh profiteth nothing. What did Paul say? In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. What did Jesus say? The flesh profiteth nothing. Let's get another verse to back that up. Galatians 5. Let's read from verse 19. Galatians 5. Let's read from verse 19. Before we read 19, let's look at 16 of Galatians 5. Are you there? Read with me. This I say then, do what? Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What we have in that verse are two opposites. The life in the Spirit and the life in the flesh. The Bible says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, what are the lusts of the flesh? Let's go to verse 19. You may read with me. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, 
hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Those are the things you and I can do without help from God. That's what we can do. That's what's written in our genes. Are you with me? We do these things naturally now. I'm not saying one person does all of them. One person only has to do one. And you're disqualified for God's kingdom. Are you with me? How many sins did Adam commit before God put him out? One. All of these are the works of the flesh. We do them. Now look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Verse 22, verse 23. We have the works of the flesh. That's what we do. And we have the fruits of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit does. Not you. Not I. I cannot produce the fruits of the Spirit. If I did that, they would cease to be the fruits of the Spirit. They'd be the fruits of Randy Skeet. The works of the flesh are manifest. Adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like the verse says, in other words, ad infinitum, etc., etc., etc. That's what we can do. The fruits of the Spirit. That's what a divine power does in us when we are surrendered. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, say it with me. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believeth in him. Who is him? What does that mean? Go to 1 Corinthians 1. Let's read verse 30. When you believe in Jesus, what are you believing in? When you have Christ, what do you have? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's read verse 30. First Corinthians, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First Corinthians, chapter 1, reading verse 30. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now the verse is saying, God has made Jesus to, to be to us wisdom, righteousness. Sanctification, redemption. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, believeth in him, that in him is wisdom, in him is righteousness, in him is sanctification, in him is redemption. More than in him is, he is redemption. Jesus is righteousness. Let me pause on righteousness. Yesterday we read in Proverbs, not Proverbs, uh, Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. We read in Psalm 43, verse 7, man was created for the glory of God. We read in Psalm uh, Isaiah 6, verse 3, the whole earth is full of the glory of God. And so heaven and earth and everything in them were created for the glory of God. In the new world is coming, it's the same way. Everything must be, come on, for the glory of God. Everything must be for the glory of God. How can you and me, how can you, yes, how can we reflect the glory of God? Let's go to John chapter 15. John 15. Our subject Lord, save me. 25 minutes to 7. We're in good time. 
Do you have John 15? All right. Remember now, Isaiah 43, verse 7, I have created him for my glory. That's what the Bible says. Also, verse 21 of Isaiah 43. Listen to Jesus Christ. John 15, verse 8. Read with me. What does that say? Herein, come on, is my Father glorified. How? That he bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. How is God glorified when we produce or when the fruits of the Spirit are produced in us? But remember, they are the fruits of the Spirit, not the fruits of human beings. Because the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. And goodness is one of the fruits of the Spirit. What am I trying to tell you? Salvation is accomplished by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. If you introduce any other means of salvation, Calvary becomes unnecessary. As long as there's something called Calvary and the empty tomb, salvation is possible only through Jesus Christ. But why would any man or woman feel the need for Jesus Christ? There's something called the law of God. One of the functions of God's law is to convict a person of sin. You're wrong. That's what the law says, you're wrong. Now the law doesn't say you're wrong, let me save you. The law just says, come on, you're wrong. And when you say, what can I do? The law tells you, go to him. Go to him. Are you with me? You are wrong. Let's go to Romans 7. Romans 7. We read from verse 10, from verse 7, sorry, of Romans 7. Verse 7 of Romans 7. Our subject, Lord, save me. Do you have Romans 7? Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? What's the next statement? God forbid. Now that God forbid is a strong statement. God forbid under no circumstances. Uh-uh. No way. The law is not sin. Now, if the law is not sin, what is the law? Well, just think of the opposite of sin. If the law is not sin, what is the law? Righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. The law is not sin. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. For I had not known sin except by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So Paul is telling us it was the law that convicted him that he was a sinner. Then Christ met him. Let me say it again. The law of God is the instrument God uses under the Spirit's control to convict a person of being a sinner. Remove the law and conviction of sin is not possible because there's no standard. Christ is the power to live in harmony with God's law. You know why Adam sinned? He violated the commandments of God. It's very simple. Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, our subject. Lord, save me. Genesis 2. Are you there? I want you to read verse 16. Just the first line. What does that say? And the Lord God... Okay, say it again. The Lord God Amen. commanded. Stop. He commanded him. Go to chapter 3. Let's read verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. 
And he said, verse 11, who told thee that thou was naked? Now you read with me. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? We have command twice. Go to verse 16 or verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I, come on, commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse is the ground for thy sake. Now, we have command, Genesis 2.16. We have command, Genesis 3.11. We have command, Genesis 3.17. Adam sinned because he violated the command of God. Jesus had to die because the command, the commandment of God, the law of God, was violated. When you and I are saved, we are saved by being restored to a right relationship with God's law. Let me say differently. The only way to be right with God is to be right with his law. If you attack the Constitution of the United States, and you're not a born citizen, you're naturalized, that can be revoked. Are you listening to me? Because you have violated the law of the land, the Constitution. Now, the Ten Commandments are God's constitution for his universal government. Any violation of that is a threat to the government of God. The angels obey the same commandments. Sin is a violation of God's commandments, whether one or all ten. Adam and Eve violated God's law. And God said to them, in the day you eat or the day you disobey or the day you sin, the punishment is death. The instant they sinned, everything changed, as I said earlier. They could not do what is right to please God. They could not come to God. They could not uh, do what is right. They could not repent of themselves because repentance is not a work of the flesh. It's a work of the spirit. If the spirit of God does not move you, you and I would never repent. That's why repentance is an expression of God's goodness. It is he that puts it in the heart to repent. The goodness of God, Romans 2 verse 4, leadeth thee to repentance. I told you in the message, good leaders plan ahead. God had a plan way back. He had to move first. In the plan of salvation, God moves first. And then it's our turn to move. He helps us to move. Are you with me? We don't help God do his. He helps us do ours. So God says, if you confess our sins, he's faithful and just. But he gives us that urge to confess. Because without that divine input, you and I would never confess. You and I would never feel sorry. That's why we cannot save ourselves. Because we naturally love sin. No matter how decent we are, the sinner naturally loves sin. That's why the very first promise of the Bible, Genesis 3.15, I will put what? Enmity. Between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It is God that has to put into us hatred for sin, which is the same thing as love for his law, which is the same thing as love for God's righteousness. The first promise of the Bible is a promise that God will put hatred in the seed of the woman for the things of the devil. Without that, we'd love sin. We may hate this one, but we love that one. When God puts love in the heart for the law, we hate everything that God hates. Until God describes us the way he described his son in Hebrews 1 verse 9, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. My brothers, my sisters, only Christ can save us. Let me say something that may sound dangerous. The church cannot save you. But Christ has a church. 
Are you with me? And when you come to him, he directs you to that church. Upon this rock, I will build what? My church. He has a church, but it is he that saves us. And so Jesus tells us in the Old Testament, Isaiah 45, verse 22, Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. There is no one else who can save you. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What is that name? Jesus Christ. What did the angel tell Joseph? She shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name what Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, which he came to take. Are you with me? He shall save his people from their sins. Why? Because they cannot save themselves. Now why did I say the title is Lord Save Me? Let's go to Matthew 14 now. 14 minutes, a quarter to seven. We are a good time. Matthew 14. You read from verse 25 of Matthew 14. Matthew was a tax collector, which means in all probability he was a thief. But the tax collectors were, that's why the Jews hated them with concentrated venom. But he met Christ and he wrote the first gospel. Paul was effectively a murderer. He met Christ. He wrote one quarter of the New Testament. It makes no difference to God what the degree of your badness is. If you will allow Christ to headbutt you, he'll bring you to your senses. Are you following me? And he'll save you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What book did I say? What chapter? 14. Reading from verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were... They were afraid and cried out, saying, It is a spirit. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be not afraid, it is I. Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, do what? Bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30, but when he saw the waves boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried what? Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Why did he say, Lord, save me? Simple answer, come on. If he could have saved himself, would he have said, Lord, save me? No. Lord, save me, the Bible says. And immediately Jesus put forth his hand and caught him and said, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou thou? Lord, save me. My brothers and sisters, you and I have a natural condition. It's called the carnal nature that takes us towards hell. We have a condition that hates God, literally hates God. It likes church but hates God. Mm. For it, church is a social occasion, not a time to meet with God. S church for the carnal nature is a social club, not worship. You and I have a nature, if not controlled, drives us away from God. The Bible says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Give me another word for enmity, just four letters. Hate. It is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. That's why we need a different nature. The one with which we're born hates God, and I'm not speaking symbolically. It hates God. It hates the things of God. It hates righteousness. It hates the law. That's the nature with which we're born. Jesus told Nicodemus, you've got to be what? Born again. And who does the work of this new birth? Only God can do it. Let's go to John chapter 3. Let's read verse 8. John 3 verse 8. Our subject, Lord, save me. You have John? Chapter 3, verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh 
or whither it goeth. Finish the verse. So is everyone that is born how? Of the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God using the Word that brings about the new birth. So that the person now loves God, loves the Bible, loves the law, loves to do what's right, just because it is right. Not because it's profitable. The new birth. Conversion. Salvation. Justification by faith. You use the term you want. means the same thing. It is accomplished by divine power. And it is done based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Remove that sacrifice. The Father can do nothing for you. Off of me. Let me say it again. I'll say it differently. By quoting a text. You know it very well. I'll just quote it. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have what? A right. On what basis will we have a right to the tree? Come on. Listen to the verse. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have right. I ask you again. On what basis are we given that right? Obedience. Now think with me. On what basis was it lost? Our disobedience. Mm -hmm. Before Adam sinned, he had rights. <laughs> yes, he had rights. When he sinned, he lost them. And they only became available now through a mediator. Give me a name for the mediator, Jesus Christ. Listen to me carefully. Every breath you take right now is a right you enjoy because of Calvary. I'm not exaggerating. Every time you blink your eye, the ability to do that rests on Calvary. Ellen White puts it beautifully, every water spring, every loaf of bread is stamped with the cross of Christ. Adam lost all his rights when he sinned. Now he can only get rights through Jesus Christ. In the new world, all our rights are restored. Why? Based on obedience to God. Because they were lost through disobedience. The gospel essentials are simple. When God made Adam and Eve, he had a standard by which they were to live. The law of God. That's how angels live. Psalm 103 verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments. <laughs> Let me put it differently. <laughs> Wherever there is intelligent life in the universe, the standard is God's law. It's a compliment from God to us that God would give you the very standard he has for angels. God could have said, well, let me give you the standard of a pig. No. Hmm? <laughs> God said, I'll give you the standard that angels are required to live up to. More than that, I'll give you the very standard that distinguished the life of Christ on this earth. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Come to me, Christ. When you accept Christ, you accept the fact. He is wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. He's life because life is righteousness. He's all of that. You accept the fact that his sacrifice pleased the Father 100%. You accept the fact that when you, you see, when you accept Christ, you, you accept him, you hold him. And you go to the Father with Christ. I was watching something on YouTube and it said, if a dog is dangerous but you're standing next to the owner, the dog is okay. You're next to the owner, are you following me? You drift away, you may, something else may happen. You're next to the owner, you're okay. You take Christ in your heart. You go to the Father. Lord, on the basis of his sacrifice, forgive me. And God has no choice. And I speak with respect. He has no choice. Because he's not looking at you. He's looking at Jesus. It's not your sacrifice that saves you. It is his. Let me tell you quickly what time is it. Listen to me carefully. 
When a sinner brought a sacrifice to the sanctuary in the Old Testament, what kind of sacrifice had to be brought? Come on. Without spot, without blemish. Are you with me? Now, the animal was chosen by the sinner. The sinner had to verify no spots, no blemishes. When the animal was brought to the outer court, who also had to check the animal? The priest. Here comes the sinner. Here comes the animal with the sinner. Listen to me carefully. I just told you God looks at Jesus, not you. Here comes the sinner with the animal. Which one has to be without blemish, without spot? The animal. Representing whom? Jesus. Which one does the priest examine? The animal. But the, the sinner had to bring it. Not send it. He had to bring it. In other words, this is my hope. Symbolically, of course. This is my hope. This is my hope of forgiveness. This is my hope of restoration. This animal. All my hopes reside on this animal symbolically. Because it represented Christ. The priest looked at the animal, not the sinner. And you wrap your arms around Jesus. You say, Father, I'm sick of my life of sin. I accept Christ, the Savior. You come to the Father with Christ. The Father checks Jesus. <laughs> not you. The very fact you've got Jesus tells the Father where your heart is. We're saved based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But when we truly accept him, accept him, something changes. And we want to live like our sacrifice. Are you with me? We want to speak like Jesus. We want to eat and dress like Jesus Christ. We want to be led by the spirit of Jesus Christ. Because the presence of Christ with a person convicts that person. And changes that person. Lord save me if you've been hoping that soy milk will save you or distilled water you're not right now keep drinking it don't misunderstand me but you can't eat your way to heaven your savior is come on tell me but he has a way for you to eat are you with me he has a way for you to dress he has a way for you to talk he has a way for you to spend your money he has a way for you to interact with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, but the salvation is his work. Because if I could eat my way to heaven, I'd tell Jesus, leave me alone. If I could dress my way to heaven, I wouldn't need Jesus. I have to keep stressing, we need Jesus. A person who is God and who is man and who is alive today. He paid the price for sin. So you and I don't have to pay it. By the way, everyone who's lost in the fires of hell will pay for their own sins. Jesus came and died for the whole world that you and I should not have to pay for our sins. Tonight, I want you to recommit your life to Christ with the consciousness it is He that can save me. And it is He that sustains me in that saved condition. It's not once saved, always saved. It is he that saves me and he that sustains me the same way he created the universe and he sustains it. He saves and he sustains what he saves. Give your life to Christ. Let him save you and change you. Let him do for you what he did for Matthew. What he did for Nebuchadnezzar. What he did for Paul. What he did for that lady of the night, Mary Magdalene. What he did for so many whose conditions seemed impossible. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. How many will say tonight, Father, I accept Jesus anew. Jesus, the person, the God, the man, as my Savior. Can I see your hand? Stand up with me. Remember the words the angel said to Joseph, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from. Favor number three, think. 
If he saves you from one thing, he saves you to something else. If he saves you from sin, he saves you to not sinning or righteousness. Let me say it again. If he saves you from sin, which is breaking the law, he saves you to compliance with his law by his grace. And let me sum it up in one word or one statement. When Christ saves you, what he gives to you is his righteous life. That's the only qualification for heaven. The righteous life of Christ. Why? Because the righteous life of Christ does not contain one sin. Why is that the only qualification for the new world or for heaven? Because the original Adam, the first Adam was put out because he committed one sin. The second Adam lived a life with no sin. And he offers that to you and to me when we accept him. That's why I said God looks at Christ, not you. It is the life of Christ in you that qualifies you and me for a place in God's kingdom. He offers to us his righteous life, something we cannot manufacture on our own. And so you stood to say, Father, save me. You must be aware that when saving you and me, he saves us from one thing to something else. From sin to righteousness, from disobedience to obedience, from rebellion to loyalty, even unto death. Because he saved us even unto death. We must be willing to save him, serve him, even unto death. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ. No change in him. He is our savior. He came in our condition, showed us the life that you've always wanted, dear God, and offers that life to us. When we accept him by faith, dear God, Help us to look away from self and our good works and look at Jesus. For by beholding, we become changed. If we behold us, we'll become like us. If we behold Christ, we'll become like him. Help us to behold the beauty of our Savior, dear God, and remain in him. So when you see him, his life covers us. Let's leave this place tonight grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, comprehensive. Let us leave tonight grateful we were reminded we cannot save ourselves. We can accept the salvation you have offered through Christ. We thank you for this plan of salvation. Let the angels go with us, dear God. Watch over us tonight, I pray. Bring us back tomorrow. In Jesus' name, let God's people say amen and amen.